Well, I got so many hits on that uh, Bundy Ranch commentary I did the other day. I thought I'd reward you loyal viewers and Bundy supporters with more Bundy coverage. I guess I got one thing right, and I missed one important thing in the earlier commentary. I warned you not to be Bundy supporters, but rather to be opponents of hurting Bundy. That might also be defined as supporters of Bundy's human rights. Not long after that, this sort of quasi-scandalous video surfaced where he was, or audio, where he was saying politically incorrect things about black folks. Now, some of you who called yourselves Bundy supporters a few weeks ago are scrambling to reposition. But those of you who simply opposed hurting him or hurting his supporters don't have to change your position at all. That's where I was and where I still am. I'm against the BLM. I'm against hurting Bundy and his supporters. And I'm for all of their human rights, as well as the human rights of BLM operatives. Sun Tzu's words are just as true for info wars as they are for shooting words, uh, shooting wars. Quote, you can be sure of succeeding in your attacks if you only attack places which are undefended. You can ensure the safety of your defense if you only hold positions that cannot be attacked. Unquote. And a position supporting everyone's human rights cannot be attacked. I normally don't organize demonstrations just because video has sort of sucked all the air out of my room. But I am getting my demonstration pack back together and I plan to head to the nearest federal building fairly soon if... Maybe I should say I, f I plan to head to the nearest federal building fairly quickly after the feds escalate this thing. I might initially just demonstrate by myself with my yellow Gadsden, Gadsden and my uh, sign that I plan to make that says uh, uh, BLM out of New Hampshire. And this is, I hope, following a different piece of Sun Tzu advice where he said, quote, appear at points which the enemy must hasten to defend March swiftly to places where you are not expected, unquote. Obviously, the peaceable version of this would be, why fight this whole thing out in the vicinity of the Bundy Ranch where you are expected, and where you're just another of many, many people? I would rather give the feds the impression that this is spreading. By spreading it, this concern over land rights, they're going to be much more worried about this kind of thing popping up all over the country than they are about what happens in just one place. If you're going to be a peaceable version of Michael Collins, well, his genius in the Irish Wars was that he did not go to one place and try to hold it like Eamon de Valera was always doing. Uh, for example, in the Easter Rising around 1916, Collins' genius was in doing small things all over the place, and although the mists of history sometimes conceal exactly what happened, he did make a, a, an effort to avoid any kind of widespread destruction. We, of course, are trying to make an effort, I hope, to avoid any destruction. But, you know, in the same way, this, this sort of sudden and growing appearance of demonstrators all over the place, very small demonstrations, but very large numbers of them, that would be the, the, the thing that sends the message to authorities, please proceed with caution. And it seems like to some extent, I got to give a little bit of credit to the Obama administration. They're doing a bit of that. They didn't just march in and shut the Bundys down. However, they will probably follow Sun Tzu's advice, too, uh, in some ways. They will not strike at the location where they are expected. They will look at the images and the most incriminating evidence they have, the least popular resistors they can find who are involved in this, the ones who are furthest out on a limb. They might, for instance, take a look at that image of the guy aiming his firearm through a barricade, if they can determine that he was aiming it in the direction of federal agents, they will probably come to his house and take him out at the same time they take three or four other 
militia types out. They will try to avoid injuring him. They will give him a long prison sentence. Now, he can probably avoid this by staying there forever, but can he stay there forever? Can all the people who went out on a limb there stay there forever? And do you think there's really going to be a revolution if the feds just arrest four people without hurting them? This is what they did in the Ed Brown situation. They followed that up by, oh, this, is, this was a situation in New Hampshire uh, where there was a standoff. It lasted about seven months, and there were you know parties there. There was it was similar to the Bundy thing in some ways. Ed Brown struck me as being a little nuttier than Mr. Bundy, but anyway, after uh, performing these uh, SWAT style arrests all over the country of people who had left the scene, they eventually declared an exclusion zone around the Brown property. They did this after Brown had uh, made mistakes. He had made serious PR mistakes. One of his reporters had been involved in a, I'm sorry, one of his supporters had been involved in a traffic accident and had, uh, it was a hit and run where he injured someone and fled the scene. Uh, this happened near the Brown house. And this substantially reduced public support for the, the Browns and their supporters Brown also uh, made some threats. At least I believe this to have happened. Uh, some threats against the families of U.S. Marshals. Basically, they just gave him some time to hang himself in a PR sense. And uh, after he had alienated more and more supporters, after the federal exclusion zone had been imposed, they began... Uh, you know, uh, you know, blocking off all the roads. Only people who lived there, you know, in the area could get through. They arrested and then quickly released Lauren Canario, one of the New Hampshire Free Stater activists, when she tried to walk through the exclusion zone. They also arrested, uh, you know, or harassed. Well, I don't know, harass, arrested may not be the right word, but they would deprive people of their vehicles if there were any registration issues. So they were just kind of going through and causing extra scrutiny of a conventional variety against people who had the audacity to be in the area. But again, they didn't shoot anybody. They didn't really threaten anybody that much. They used their process. They behaved relatively professionally. And this continued to wear down the Brown movement, if you want to call it that. You can expect some of these same techniques to be used in Nevada. But again... You don't have to fight in the location of their choosing. Again, by fight, I mean peaceably fight. They cannot declare an exclusion zone around every BLM office, every federal building, every federal outpost. Doing that is the kind of thing that would trigger a nationwide revolution. So, you should always be able to get to your nearest federal building with a sign, and that's what I did when they came for the Brown supporters. I didn't spend that much time on the Brown property or near the Brown property. I probably put together, you know, seven protests, uh, usually at federal facilities, uh, as this crisis dragged on. I gotta ask, too, uh, how many of you uh, gun cleaners out there, you know, are saying that you're getting ready to fight the authorities, maybe with your firearms, how many of you have not even yet taken the step of refusing to pay your taxes? That is a peaceable and not super controversial move that you could make right now. A move that would not endanger anybody except, to some extent, you. In the process of getting endangered, you will at least be able to relieve yourself of those 40 hours of labor you're spending every year trying to get your taxes done. And you'll be keeping your money for a while. The authorities generally don't come after average people who refuse to pay their income taxes. They come after people like me who are prominent and refuse to pay their income taxes. And I refuse to pay mine, so you can refuse to pay yours. Otherwise, you are fighting the enemy with one hand while feeding it using your other hand. Remember, fighting them does not have to follow the enemy's script. There are a thousand things you can do following your script your chosen location, your chosen methods, hopefully all peaceable. 
once shooting starts, the relative purity of this Bundy cause will become increasingly tainted. As if it's not enough already by his uh, comments. But again, it's important to realize and remember, uh, another lesson from the Brown situation, you don't want to make something about one person because anything that's about one person is about failure. Every person is a failure in some way. There are very few genuine heroes in history and very few alive today. The chances that Clive and Bundy is one of them after, you know, being closely examined for many months is probably low. But he has a family. He has uh, uh, supporters, uh, many of whom have not said any of the controversial things that he's said, and all of whom, like him, have inalienable human rights. This situation reminds me more of the 1970s Wounded Knee Crisis than it does of uh, Waco or Ruby Ridge. And I think the reason for that is may maybe numbers. There were quite a few of the American Indian Movement people who, who were involved at, at, at Wounded Knee. And I don't think the numbers really ever got very large at Waco or at Ruby Ridge. The numbers of, of people opposing federal action. And anyway, one of the things that the Wounded Knee veterans had to say was that uh, after Wounded Knee, you know, they, they basically sort of stood down. I guess it was about a 70-day standoff, and the uh, AIMs stood down and uh, decided to, to, to submit to, to the court process. And afterwards, one of them said that was the beginning of the end for our movement when we decided to do this in the courts. The AIM declined from then on and has barely been heard of lately. It's tragic because a lot of what they did was really pretty cool. Yeah, some of it not so cool. Some of it they maybe didn't even do. I wish that the conflict, the root of the conflict, were not so complicated. Uh, it's hard to, hard for the public to discern how... Just Bundy's original grievance is, you know, his claim to be able to graze on this land. It's not as cut and dried as a claim to be able to graze on your own land. Another problem is that it's got that sort of flash in the pan feel to it, kind of like the Ron Paul runs or the Ed Brown standoff. So many things in the, uh, American situation are only able to sustain themselves for about eight months. Occupy Wall Street didn't last much longer than that. The Tea Party has done fairly well compared to most of the others, but even they seem to kind of, you know, just lose some of that energy after about the eight-month mark. WikiLeaks seem to sort of peak over that period of time. Anonymous may have been an exception to that rule, and uh, the Free State Project is an exception to that rule. It's, it's a very much a, uh, a distance-running operation as opposed to a sprint. The Bundy thing can turn into a distance run as well uh, if people take action to spread it. I've always felt you do that by leveraging the authorities' abuses to your movement's advantage. So that's why I'm not going to be protesting for Bundy rights today. It's going to be more like the day after they commit a crackdown. I won't be that useful by myself doing that. But if you do it, well, it'll all be twice as useful. Be thinking about how you're going to defend the people who they target. Know that you won't be able to defend them at their house the day the SWAT team comes. It will happen while they're alone, probably. You won't be able to directly assist them. They'll be on the other side of a fortress by the time you know they're gone. So the question is, what do you do next? There should be something, because you're obviously you're not going to let the authorities just get away with that without at least raising concerns, right? No, well, you'll have the opportunity at that point to picket the jail, to picket the nearest federal building, 
or to engage in civil disobedience or a PR stunt of some kind, use it as an opportunity to grow the movement. Don't let it just rise and fall like the Ed Brown thing. There's something else to keep in mind. It's it's easy to get demoralized as all these different sort of American revolts come and go. But I wish I could find the exact quote. There was an Irish uh, veteran of the uh, of the uh, War of Independence, uh, you know, which was I guess was waged around the 1918 era, when uh, the Michael Collins boys did their thing and started raiding British convoys and so forth. One of the fighters said, basically, they felt that they were going to be engaging in a struggle that was hopeless, that they expected to be destroyed like all the other Irish rebellions over the previous 300 years, but they were just going to do it anyway. And in a peaceable context, that's kind of what we have to do, too. We have to fight a thousand losing battles, maybe, to win the war. That's that's what... Um, I guess the uh, the American Revolutionary General, uh, I can't remember which one it was, it may have been Gage, he was in the South, whoever it was, uh, he was in, his, in a hopeless tactical situation. So what he did was he went out and he did that. He went and lost a thousand battles to win the war. Now, it wasn't quite a thousand, it was probably more like you know, 30 or 40, but what he did was he just made, he made the British Army chase him all over the South. He kept them constantly harried on edge, and eventually their presence around that area uh, turned the southern people against the London government. Well, again, wars now are fought as info wars more than shooting wars, and we should be avoiding the shooting. Let them do that. But you can still keep the enemy harried, harassed, in a legal way. Lawful way, maybe, is what I'm saying. Or in a civil disobedience way, if you think that escalation is appropriate. And mostly the way I'll be doing that is with the on-camera ambush interview. Your methods may be different. But never let them make you feel powerless. You have a thousand options at your disposal. Do some thinking. If you don't think you're creative, then look at the video description for this clip. I've posted a link that has a lot of different options. Peaceable options for rebellion. One of them has got to be a match for you. It's like in sales. The key is continued activity. If you have a lot of activity, you will have a lot of sales. And in this ongoing peaceable revolution in the United States, we just need continuing activity. Just make sure the activity is efficient and not unnecessarily risky. Oh, you know, I never mentioned the thing that I got wrong. I failed to point out and predict what the feds would do. Uh, and that is that they would wait. They probably still will wait. But part of that waiting process is they're uh, trying to come off as the good guy. George Washington did this before moving in on the whiskey rebellers. Whiskey rebels, I guess I should say. Or maybe it was Jay's Rebellion I'm thinking about. I get confused. But uh, part of the reason the authorities wait is to let the other side make mistakes so they can demonize them. That worked very well with Ed Brown, and I should have mentioned it uh, because that's kind of what happened with Bundy. The, the lull gave Bundy enough rope to hang himself with in a PR sense. Know that they will do this and know how you will react. This program is brought to you by Freekeen.com. Freekeen.com features audio, video, and blogs chronicling the transition to a voluntary society. Freekeen.com also has comments and discussion forums so you can be heard. Freekeen.com.